with esteemed institutions such as University Technology Petronas and University Malaysia Perlis. Currently serving as an Associate Professor at University Brunei Darussalam Center for Lifelong Learning, Dr. Tazli brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the table. Holding a PhD in Chemical Engineering from Imperial College London and a certified HRD Corp trainer, Dr. Tazli stands as a beacon in the realm of learner center pedagogy and AI integrated teaching. His dedication extends beyond the academic sphere where he empowers educators and students through workshops, championing innovative, innovative tools for enhanced productivity, effective problem solving, and enriched research. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Associate Professor Dr. Tazli Azizan. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, I'll be sharing with every one of you uh, about this topic on complementing genetic AI. So I know that every one of you now with the emergence of ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is just the tips of the iceberg, right? It's like, can you guess how many tools outside there already being generated as being called generative AI tools? Anyone have any numbers? There are actually about 6,000 tools outside already. Okay? It's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. That's why I said that uh, ChatGPT is just the tips of the iceberg. But of course, there are many other tools which has been developed using ChatGPT engine and so on. And this is what we call as generative AI. Um, I would like you to join me in Mentimeter. Okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk alone. I want you to interact with me as well. So can you please go to www.menti.com okay? Or you can just scan the QR code Is it scannable? Yeah Okay, cool And now uh, you can go to this code uh, 8177196 Okay, so I'm going to go there for a while And I have a question If you have joined, just put a like button just to show to me that you're already there. Are you there? Okay. So the first question that I'd like to ask is, how much do you believe that AI will take over the world? <laughs> so the question, all right, that's what I answer. Okay, so this is some of the feedback I got. Um, it's okay. um, some of you think that I don't think so. Um, some of you believe that AI may take over the world. Um, oh, okay. Majority of you believe. I think um, that the one using AI may take over the world, and uh, some of you also <laughs> think that we are doomed. Um, which already AI already take over the world. Okay. Good sign. <laughs> um, so let's have a look uh, back at the slides here. Maybe a little bit. Maybe some of you might have questions about what is the difference between AI and generative AI, right? AI is a big thing, okay? AI is more beyond than generative AI. Um, if they say, you just say that ChatGPT is, is part of AI, yes, it is part of AI, but it is most accurately, we define that ChatGPT is one of the tools as part of the generative AI. Because in AI itself, there are so many things, uh, for example, like the driverless car that you are using, it is AI, but it is not generative AI. The Siri on the phone that you are using, it is part of AI, but it is not generative AI. Okay? The Google Home, for example, some of you have Alexa, Google Home, or you have Netflix. After you watch Netflix, what comes next? Personalization, right? Recommendation, what to watch next? That is not generative AI. Generative AI is something that when you give, a, because it, 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 it is actually a combination between NLP, they call it natural language processing, as well as machine learning. Okay, uh, and it goes into deep learning, so that combination of both gave generative AI. So um, that's why you have generative AI, um, a lot of tools right now, when you have um, generative AI, it, it, it able to generate content uh, with human input, for example, like editing, writing, music, and art creation. If they say you are using in the class, supposedly, if you are using it correctly, then we will be able to help the students to improve their critical thinking, 
problem solving capability as well as creativity. I think it's also helping um, the educators as well because most of the time in the past when I ask educators why we are not using this kind of um, assessment for example when we talk about assessment for example like why are you using problem based learning um, I'm not that creative you know but that shouldn't be a problem right now when you are starting to use generative AI what matters in teaching and learning is that um, this is the findings from McKinsey and Company most of the time this is, I think, among the teachers, uh, not, not um, a bit, but then I think it's also applicable to us as the lecturers. Um, what happens is that most of the hours that we spend at the, of, at, at, the, at the workplace is not a direct contact with the students. We spend it mostly preparation, evaluation, feedback, professional development, administration, and so on, but less than 50% are only engagement with the students. Right? We want to develop the students, we want to mold the students, we want to assist the students in learning, yet we are not spending a lot of time with the students. Because there are lots of our time being allocated for something else, like preparation of the content. Now, you know, how many hours that you prepare for the slides in comparison to you, getting use that slide for contact with the students. Right? So this is something that we may, we may reflect ourselves. So right now, with the emerging of generative AI, for example, you can just create slides in seconds. You know, you can just give some text information and be able to create slides immediately for you. Then that, that, that task is done, except that you may want to actually go through bit by bit just to ensure that it is it's, it's actually correct, for example. Um, it's actually um, according to the level of the intended outcome that you want to your students. So that's, that's what we can do. So this is one of the reasons why I said that for me, generative AI, when it comes to chat GPT, is a blessing. I would say it's a blessing. I used to be very workaholic, very, very workaholic in the past. I sleep at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., at night, you know, uh, crafting things, contents, uh, writing papers, and all those kind of things, right? But it's not healthy. It's not healthy because you, you have lack of sleep and then you, have, you, you become more stressful because you want to balance your life, your family and so on. Right now, I'm start working and we have this kind of generative AI. I'm still, I think I'm still productive, Alhamdulillah. I think I still manage to be able to meet the targets that I want to meet. But at the same time, I can still have time for Netflix. I can still have time for, you know, um, socializing with others, for example. And I think my life is less stressful in that sense. Um, when I decided to pause a while my academic journey, I, I, I ended working at Unimed end of 2021, and I have one and a half year uh, establishing my company, Scholar Malaysia. So usually, uh, this is uh, actually education uh, training consultancy company. Most of the time, when the client asks me about, uh, can you give us a proposal, you know, proposal for the training? And then usually we like to actually not to have the on-the-shelf uh, proposal. We tend to have what we call as a customized proposal, you know, personalized one for them. And sometimes it takes me about two weeks just to think about what are the things that I can personalize for them. What are the best content that I could, I could give to them? What are the best activities I could design for them? But right now with ChatGPT, that two hours become only one hour a complete proposal. You know, so that is kind of transformation that, that you could have if, let's say, you be able to use it effectively. But of course, on top of, you want to make sure that, um, uh, what do you call that? You want to make sure that your teaching and learning become effective by using generative AI. It's not just simply, you know, okay, I want to ask ChatGPT what should I do and so on. It's not just like that, right? The most important thing is you need to understand first the framework, the background, the theoretical behind it. So for example, the first one that you must understand is, uh, I think it's very famous, I think, because M3A adopted this kind of framework, constructive alignment, right? So, siapa yang tak, tak tahu tentang constructive alignment? Everyone knows about constructive alignment. But constructive alignment, actually, it has three important components inside that. The first one is the learning outcome, which is the intended outcome that we want. We want 
what kind of uh, things that we want our students to, to be. You know, that is actually our intended outcome. After this course, what do we want our students to be? What do we want our students to have? What kind of skills that our students we want our students to have? That is our intended outcome. And of and usually when we want to make sure that the students achieve the intended outcome, we measure it through the assessment. So that is why actually we do the assessment, right? But most of the time as well, people are forgetting about the instructions, which is the pedagogy behind that. So. We tend to stick to the traditional way of doing things. Okay, we spread out in our course and in our class, the students be able to achieve to do analysis on da 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 da. The students be able to evaluate, be able students be able to propose something or create something. You know, we put a very high level kind of blue taxonomy uh, verbs inside our learning outcome. But ended up when we do the assessments, we still keep doing. Final, written, close-ended examination. Okay? You know, not open-ended. Final, written, close-ended examination. And we hope that the students should be able to achieve, you know, at, uh, ability to create, ability to evaluate. Do you know that when you conduct written, final examination, close-ended, within three hours, what are the skills that you can actually, what are the level of blue taxonomy that you can actually achieve? Up to what level? C1, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. C5. You cannot go up to C5 actually. Even C4 is quite difficult. You, most of the time you just go to C3. And how can that you say in your learning outcomes you are you are actually producing students with level C5 and C6, yet in the assessment it's only up to C3. So it's not aligned. It is not aligned at all. Right? So that's why it is very important for us to look into different kind of assessments. It's not just simply, you know, final exam, uh, written examination, close-ended. It's, 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 it's not going to produce the students that we want. I give you an example. Uh, how many of you here take the PSR? <laughs> many of us, right? <laughs> Do you remember in Karangan Bahasa Malaysia, we used to write Karangan Autobiography Akus Batang Teng. Right? That actually, that karangan is a kebab karangan, you know that? It's a higher order thinking skills of karangan. Okay? But then, the issue is, if let's say, the teachers already know that in the UPSR, there's going to be come out that kind of karangan. Okay? That essay will come out. And then what she did, or he did, is actually repetitively asking you to write the same essay over and over again, Cuma minggu ni aku sebatang pen merah, next week aku sebatang pen biru, the other week aku sebatang pen hijau. Because she knows that gonna, in the exam nanti, there's going to be a karangan about aku sebatang pen. So if let's say you you give an instruction for the student to write aku sebatang pen, what will be the bloom taxonomy level that the student will achieve? Support the Remembering. It, it can go up to C3 actually, application. Right? The students apply the knowledge and writing autobiography punya essay. But if you keep repeating, doing again and again, every week, every single week, aku sepatang pen biru, aku sepatang pen merah, and then in the final exam, it looks like, okay, there is an essay, aku sepatang pen, come out. What are the level of, of, of the students right now? C1. Only C1. Because they're just memorizing. And that is the purpose of assessment. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't allow the student to achieve the higher order thinking skills that we want. So that is why it is very important for us to align, okay? Whenever that you want to make sure that the students achieve the intended outcome, we have to make sure it is aligned with the instruction that we, do, that we give, as well as the assessment that we give. So these three things must be together. Even actually when you're starting to use ChatGPT or Generative AI, this must come into the context. The good thing is that Generative AI is good enough to give an aligned output to you. Uh, that, that's, that's what, I, as far as I, I could recall, Whenever that I use ChatGPT to ask for the assessments, for the activities and so on, it gives an aligned one. But bear in mind, you have to make sure that you have to check the facts, okay? You, you cannot just simply accept as it is. Another important thing that we want to do to make sure that the students are learning is what we call as scaffolding. How many of us, whenever that we give project to the students, we give in week 2, right? <laughs> and we ask them to submit in week 14, for example, or 13, for example. Uh, 
and you never check the progress. You just assume that you're going to submit a very high quality work in work that in week One When they will do that actually? One week before. The night before, right? Eh? <laughs> the night before. Probably one and, day before. And how did, how did they do that? Divide and compile. <laughs> Divide and compile. And never check each other's work as long as we compile. Sometimes there are a lot of free riders as well. You know? But this is the thing when actually you, you, when you don't provide supports to them, and that is why actually they will just maintain at individual level. Even if they say they just, they just use ChatGPT, for example, they just want to generate the solution for them. If we don't provide the assistance for them, this is where they're going to be, still at individual level. And this is what happened to our university students. They come to the universities, they enter our class, they just listen to our lecture, and we expect them to be different, which you cannot, unless you provide assistance for them, unless you provide support to them. And what kind of support that you can give? For example, one is actually instructional support. From you yourself as an instructor, you support them. You can create an environment where there is a peer support. As well as you can create an environment where now, right now, you have generative AI like ChatGPT to give support to them as well. So instead of they just copy and paste from ChatGPT, there are a lot of plenty ways that you can just allow the students to use ChatGPT to support their learning. Okay, so, so that, that is where today this company comes to. What matters in assessment, this is what we're supposed to do. Okay, we provide this test for them. We put a very high target, but in order for them to reach that target, we provide steps. Right? And we're not supposed to do it like this, which is we give a very complex task without assistance. And we're not supposed to do it like this, which is lowering the bar. You're not supposed to do like that. Right? Okay, all these images are generated by, by, by ChatGPT. Thank you, ChatGPT. Okay? But, um, but I, I realize that some of us, we have a tendency that, okay, we give a complex question for the students. But in our class, we never, we, we just stick to the lecture, for example. And we hope that the students will be able to answer that. We cannot do that. That's where actually scaffolding comes in. That is where actually the activities inside the class is also very important to make sure that we can come with a good assessment. Okay? You cannot just simply assume to change the assessment without changing your pedagogical strategies inside the class. That must come, as, as, as I told you earlier, it has to be aligned with each other. Okay, how to implement generative AI in classroom assessment? I just want to get your ideas. Maybe you can share with me your thoughts first. If let's say you have conducted something in your class, please share. If let's say you have some ideas, you want to test it. Uh, but, then, but then don't, don't, please don't ask the GPT right now lah to give us. <laughs> Sharing your thoughts, what, what do you think? How do you implement the AI in classroom assessments? Of course, you know that the wonder of chat GPT, you can generate and see few questions. Have you tried that? You can generate rubric from that. Uh, you can generate um, a lot and lots of questions, right? But then, what, what else that you could do? Okay, um, if I can teach in language, you can assist the student. Okay, you can ask questions. Student find answers at GPT, review answer in class. Okay, good. Open-ended question, case study. Compare individual answer with that generated by AI. Wonderful. Ask students to practice giving useful and meaningful inputs to chat to get inspiration for situation and question, analyzing content, case study, by asking students to generate answers and um, generate answers and ask students to compare and find out difference, okay? Case study and do discussion, brainstorm ideas, generate case studies, problems, problem-based learning, good. I think, um, these are part some of the things. I think you, you already got the ideas like how best that you can implement generative AI in classroom assessment. That's good. Alright. Student so can problem or scenario based question. They include chat GPT in the classroom and presenting, PBL and so on. Oh, okay. Um, 
There are actually several things I would like to share with you in order for us to implement Genetics AI in classroom assessment. Uh, there are four things I would like to share with you. The first thing is actually to train students how to use Genetics AI. This is also very important. I, I, I noticed that many of us, uh, we anticipate that, okay, it's just technology, the Gen Z know well, you know, Gen Alpha know well how to use technology. But ended up, they just use technology for copy and paste. Right? This is where actually we should step in to help them, to assist them, to show them what is the capability of generative AI more than just copy and paste. Right? For example, like getting them to think critically, better prompting, for example. Use, uh, they teach them the arts of prompting, for example. That is something that we, we can do inside our class. Right? And um, among other things, for example, like we can do is to give them like creative tasks, uh, active reading and self-assessment. I decided that since there is a chat GPT coming in, I or, uh, before this, I think that giving complex articles for them to read is, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Even actually my students before struggling to read textbook. Agree? Even they do not know where to highlight. They put, when they use the highlighter, they don't highlight it, they highlight everything. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Okay? But then this is where actually we can allow the students reading complex material and check the chat GPT to identify what are the keywords that's very important to this talk, to, to this text, for example. Have you tried giving a, a, a complex text to them, ask them to read, and maybe they can also ask chat GPT, generate 10 comprehension questions so that I can understand this text better. That's also something that you can do. Okay? Maybe the students wanted to do revision for their exam. Again, exams, right? They want to do a revision for the exam, and then they can use ChatGPT just to help them with the revision. Giving some kind of text, summarize this text, for example, or maybe giving this text, generate some kind of hypothetical question for me to understand about, about this. You know? So those are the things that we can teach our, uh, and train our students. And the third one is online mapping and brainstorming. I realize that some of the students are also lazy to write notes. They claim the lecture notes are their own notes. Right? Because I, say, I keep saying that lecture notes belong to the lecturers. If you want to make your own notes, you have, if you want to claim it as a student notes, you have to make your own notes. So how best it can do the note taking, for example. So these are some things that you can use generative AI to assist them. So as I mentioned earlier, it's about scaffolding them. Right? Many of our students, I realize that, um, still do not have the capability, um, I think in terms of their, their reading, comprehension, in terms of their understanding towards the topics, in terms of their note-taking skill, mind-making skill, are not there yet. So this is where actually we'll be able to assist them. It used to be very difficult before this because, you know, we have like 100 and 200 students inside our class. But we can do that better right now if we teach them how to use that AI very well. So for example, um, before this, I think um, students is a bit difficult for them to do creative writing. So you can give like, um, you give them some kind of unique stories or starting point for them to, to write. You can ask ChatGPT to generate a starting point and ask them to write first on their own and then they can start to compare with the output from ChatGPT, right? Like some of you suggested. Maybe, for example, if let's say you are teaching language, this is hypothetical things that you could do. For example, in the, at, the, at the first time, you wanted the students to write about something. Write an essay, right? And then um, they could initially you can ask them individually. I would like you to brainstorm your ideas first without using ChatGPT. Okay, brainstorm first. You know, so they can start to brainstorm on their own. And the next thing that you can do is ask them to pair up. You know, okay, now you can pair up together, discuss your brainstorm ideas. And right now, now try to ask ChatGPT what are the output from that, from from that ChatGPT itself and make a comparison and present it. You know, so that is one of the ways that we could leverage using it rather than, okay, go and ask ChatGPT straight away. But we can always tell the students that, look, sometimes your thoughts may be a bit different than what ChatGPT gives, for example. Maybe better, for example. So this is where, the way that how we can develop the critical thinking among the students. But of course, it comes with scaffolding. You cannot just simply assume that the student you know, okay, go and brainstorm with ChatGPT. Of course, they're going to ask ChatGPT straight away. Right? 
and maybe you want to continue writing the essay. Maybe the students have no idea about, okay, how to write the essay? Okay, let's start first with your own introduction. And then pair up, share your introduction with each other, for example. And then ask that to speak to generate an introduction. And maybe compare, okay, how, how well that you write your introduction with what generated by chat GPT? Is it better? What can you improve? So these are the things that can keep improve the critical thinking of the students. You see, you see what, what, what I mean, right? And the second one, for example, like um, artistic design. So for example, like this, maybe some of you haven't tried to give students tasks like creating posters. Now, with Canva, everyone can design, for example. You know, you can use Canva for that, right? But at the same time, you want to come up with some artistic image and so on. The arts of prompting it is also another way to critically enhance the students to come up with a good art design, for example. So these are some um, apps that you can use, like Leonardo AI, Dolly, Meet Journey. So it can offer some kind of AI-generated visuals. For example, if let's say you ask students to write reflection, right? Um, usually we ask students to write, but sometimes we can also have a photo reflection. Maybe they can reflect using prompting. So they can come up with, you know, a good image to, to, to share what they feel, what they think about the content they are teaching, for example. Another one is maybe for, for music, for example, generate songs for topics. This is something creative work that we, we can always do because there are a lot of uh, AI music composers that you can use. Okay? Um, Alright, right now, let's have a look at um, your own thoughts. If, let's say, you want to teach your students using generative AI, what are the things that you can do inside your class? After I give some, some, some examples, maybe you can think of your own examples. What are the assessments that you can give to the students uh, to suit your course? Interesting. Poster presentation from a movie related to theories or SDG. Nice. Role play, ops, analyzing data, video assignment, write a project proposal, and so on. Wonderful. Wonderful. <coughs> Great illustration for storybook. See, now you start to have a lot of more <coughs> ideas about alternative assessment rather than stick to tests and final written examinations, for example. Right? We can have more than that, actually. Um, Scenario-based process simulations. And you know what? Actually, when you, when you do these kind of activities with the students, I think they remember more than they remember about taking the exams. Right? Because once they study for the exams, they just study, memorize it, and then, you know, dump it out, and then that's it. But if, let's say, compared to the activities that you're doing inside the class, like this, I think this is much more Wonderful. For example, like create illustration for storybook. You can sell that storybooks. You can you can allow the students to earn income through that. Right? So that is one of the things that we, we can always do. Uh, I'm giving one example that um, I have with my I think my with my students. Um, I actually I did recently on uh, infographic actually. Okay, creation of infographic. Um, so for example, like the students need to use I say to them that they can use ChatGPT, they can use Canva, but at the same time, I want them to make a real interview with a Bruneian based enterprise, for example. Because I know, you know what? Because ChatGPT doesn't have much information about Brunei, so we are safe. <laughs> right? So, so I go localized. You know, I give the, I give, I give the output as localized output. 
Rather than, you know, I give them about, okay, uh, interpret the Tesla business, for example. Tesla, of course, they can find in ChatGPT, right? But if they say, I say, I say to them, go and find the audio of Go Mama. Go Mama is like the Zupanda in, in Brunei. Okay? Go Mama and ask them about um, how, what kind of innovation that they have, for example. Interview them. And put in the infographic. You know, put in, 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 in infographic. So they realize that ChatGPT that they are using is just, just part of the process. Just part of the, you know, making the text look nice, better, but then the input still come from that. So that, that is um, somehow the infographic question that I ask. And also I ask them to do reflection writing. Because after they finish the infographic and then they reflect the journey of the process of, you know, doing that kind of infographic, what do they get, for example. Um, and of course, we give this some tips of success and also we provide some kind of rubric and so on. Uh, if you want an example of it, I can share with you a thing later. Lah. I'll, I'll share with the organizer. Okay? Another thing that I did recently, just recently, a few days ago, is online live forum. ChatGPT cannot do that. Right? ChatGPT cannot do online live forum. They have to do that. But of course, in order for them to do the talking points, you know, they need to generate it. And then, they need to act as a panel, as a moderator. We give them some topics, and then I say, okay, five of you, one of you going to be a moderator, four of you going to be a panelist. And you talk about it. I'm going to record this session. I'm going to invite your friends as well to join the session. Right? So it gives them some kind of opportunity to do something else rather than a typical <laughs> presentation, you know, rather than a typical um, report writing. So, because they have different kind of opportunity to do so. Okay. Let's have a look at um, another the theme that we can use. The second thing that we can focus is actually developing skills that AI cannot do. And this is something that we have to get in mind. There are things that AI cannot do, which is like empathy. How do we teach empathy inside the class? Right? Second one is about critical thinking, interdisciplinary thinking, how best that we can use generative AI to teach this, and AI cannot do on all on its own. And the third one is to put some kind of ethical consideration, right? I think to teach them about ethics and integrity. This is also something that we can do inside our class. So for example, like uh, example of assessment, we can use like, have you heard about empathy maps? So for example, if they say, I think you are doing a business, and then before you develop your product, you need to develop an empathy map. So, ChatGPT cannot develop entity maps on its own, but it can assist you in order for you to develop that kind of maps. Because you want to understand your, 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 your customer, right? your client, your future client. So, when you interview them, and then you need to put, put map that in the entity maps. That is one of the things we can do. Ethical debates, for example. So, this is something that AI cannot do. Or cross-cultural co collaboration and communication. Um, so, we can use generative AI. For example, like right now, maybe you can start to make your student collaborate with a student from China or maybe from India or maybe from Mexico for example because uh, before this is the hindrance of the language, right? But right now, you can use ChatGPT. Everybody, you can use only own language and then start to translate with each other and learn with each other. Solve a global problem. Maybe. I don't know. There is something possible with generative AI. And uh, this is an example of uh, empathy map. So for example, like, you can actually, if you want the template, you can just go to Canva. Okay, Canva whiteboard has a template about empathy map. So you can have, um, when, you, uh, when you question the customers, the client, you can start to write about what they think and feel, what they see about it, what they hear about it, what they say and do, and you can also identify what are the pain and gain. So this is some, some kind of work that you can give to your students. So you can student, your students can actually start to interview people around. Right? And of course, AI cannot do that. Um, theme 3 is we are looking at evaluating learning process, not only final artifacts. Uh, this is also very important. Most of the time, when you give project to the students, do you ask for the progress, for example? Do you ask for their, um, for example, like, have, you, have you checked the progress in between? Do you check, what, for example, like how they're going to solve this? When they are making decision, for example, how they make that decision? Do you ask that question? Or you just finally take out whatever the final output that they have and you give grade in place of that? This is something, a practice that we want to change. 
Rather than we focus on only the final artifacts, the final output, we are also looking at the process. We measure the process. So to the extent that if let's say you are doing assignment to the student, ask the students to submit together their prompts. You say, okay, you can use GPT for this, but submit your prompts. There are marks also for your prompts, for example. You know, so that because it's part of the process that they are using. Okay, so that, that is something that you can do. Um, so for example, like, um, okay, I give you an uh, idea here. Research project logs, for example. Right? When you make a research, um, there is a law. Usually it's going to be very taxing, but of course, when you have AI with you, you know, just type some prompts and you'll be able to generate something and keep it as a law. Okay? Uh, collaborative problem solving. I think problem based learning is also another issue, right? Like, for example, before this, we're thinking about developing a problem. We, we don't know how to develop a problem. I'll give you an example here. Uh, Okay, this is, I'm using ChatGPT Plus, for example, uh, and already custom the channel. Uh, so I said that I plan to conduct problem-based learning for my students taking innovation management and the objective are for them to be able to appraise existing innovation that happened around them, especially in Brunei. Develop a fictitious yet authentic look of a problem for them to solve and the solution should be able to be directly generated from ChatGPT, but they can use it as part of the process. This to be actually take two weeks to solve. So this is why actually they come up with innovating uh, Brunei's ecotourism industry. Okay, and it gives somehow uh, some background, a problem. You are part of a dynamic team at the Brunei Innovation Council, tasked with revamping the ecotourism sector, etc. Objective is to research and evaluate current successful innovation. Uh, you need to. Um, sustainable tourism model development, uh, flexibility, and this is deliverables, which is a detailed report, uh, presentation showcasing your model, and different timeline, and so on. And of course, you can further proceed with this, for example, like asking um, what are the rubrics, for example. Okay, maybe I'll give you the, like, some ideas. How do you proceed with the rubric creation? for the above problem to include not measuring the final output only okay. but also the process in getting the solution using rating 1 to 5 and each rating has its own descriptor put in put in table So here, this is where actually you prepare a rubric so that you can measure the process as well as the final output, right? And it comes up with, with its own evaluation rubric. <laughs> which is uh, much easier for you, right? So they are measuring the research and present, which is part of the process, right? And innovation and proposal, visibility uh, analysis, stakeholder engagement, marketing strategies, and so on and so on. Of course, now it's, it's, it's proposal. Yeah, we are making a presentation, so the presentation and delivery as well is being included. So this is one of the ways that we can do the assessment for the student, which is measuring the process, as well as measuring the final output. Okay? Alright. Um, and finally, I would like to bring you to the final thing. Okay? which is what we call as honoring learner agency and multipurpose of motivation. Okay. 
Um, I think this is a bit out of the box solution. Um, for example, like first of all, we must understand that the motivation of the learners does not only come from the assessment that we give. If they say, how if you try to empower them with their own assessment? How, how if they say that you empower them to think about what are the, how best that I could assess you? Like, for example, like our appraiser, you know, like those working at the corporate, every year we have actually uh, decided, pre-decided with the boss, for example, what are the things that we wanted to do for that particular year in order for, the, for us to be assessed. That will actually improve our motivation in working. The same thing that we can actually adopt in learning. If they say that, you will tell them, okay, you're going, this is the objective, the outcome you're going to achieve by this year. So how do you think that the best way in order for you to achieve this outcome? Of course, this is going to be out of box. Uh, this, that really is a big, big thing. So how do I measure them? Uh, someone got exam, someone got no exam or something like that? Uh, that is where actually, of course, you need to think out of the box for that. Right? We cannot just simply stick to the current way of doing things. You stick, still stick to current way of doing things, of course, it's gonna, not going to be materialized. Right? So what are the things that you can use, for example, choose your own journey? So the students can start to choose their own journey. In order for them to meet, final, meet the outcome, they can choose their own journey to be there. And you assess that. How competence are there to meet, to, to, to be there. Right? And second one is on the reflective journals. This is also important. Equivalently, all the time when they are doing something, they write, they, they write their own reflection. And you can also have a personalized learning pathways for them. So that is part of the assessment that we can do uh, as, as part of final assessment. Okay? So how to, st how to start designing your AI proof assessment? Um, of course, we need to decide first outcomes to be assessed. And we need to assess whether the current assessment is AI proof or not. Okay? For example, like if the answer is not easily generated by AI. Uh, if not, what are other alternative assessments that can still make the outcome? If you want to make the assessment a bit complex, will the student be able to attempt it with the assistance by AI? Uh, does the rubric prepare only measure the outcomes or the process included? And you also need to ask, evaluate how AI can be integrated into the assessment, in what way the student will use it. Okay. Um, with that, I think um, the time is running up already. Okay, but maybe I just want to ask you what is your takeaway from this session so you can respond to me, um, your, your reflection. Uh, what, what, what do you think that you learned from this session? So thank you very much. I think it's open for... Is it questions? Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Tazli. Uh, I would request that you remain on the stage for a while. Now we have a um, few minutes to probably answer one or two questions if um, anyone has any. I wonder how, how you can use chat GPT for to help uh, learning in uh, mathematics and physics. Okay. okay. And this is one question. Uh, another thing is, uh, what do you think the chat GPT will, will undermine the student ability to search for knowledge in the traditional way? We will go to the library and various sources, we gather all the knowledge from that in a natural way. But now with the AI, we just start in only you can, you can answer. So I think it will like undermine our ability to search for information. Okay, I got you. All right. Um, the first one, how best that we can teach, for example, like students to answer, to, to uh, learn mathematics and physics? I would, um, if, if I were you, for example, teaching mathematics and physics, of course, I'm not going to ask my students to go and find answers from ChatGPT, for example, you know, because ChatGPT as well, so, so much, some kind of uh, limited capabilities as well, when um, they can actually, if let's say, for example, you try to upload a question, so if you, let's say you go to ChatGPT, and then um, you, if let's say you're using class question, you can just upload an image or document about um, the mathematics question, for example. Um, I think some, someone has shown me that they tried to upload an uh, Admax question and then ChatGPT be able to, to give the answer. But I would actually ask ChatGPT, for example, to create wrong answers for me. One of the ways to test the critical thinking of the students, I say, okay, ChatGPT, please generate wrong answers or, you know, maybe 10% of the calculation is wrong. 
and I show to the, to the student. So right now, class, can you think on your own first what went wrong with this solution? For example. Okay? Now, in a team, collaborate together, try to solve, try to give the best output in comparison to this. So that's why actually they do the calculation. You know, that's, that's the way how they check facts, for example. Rather than, you know, okay, ask ChatGPT to find the solution. Not really. But that is the way how best that you can actually, rather than you want to think how best that I can make it wrong, you can also ask ChatGPT, you know, make it wrong somehow, so that I can check the student whether they really understand it or not. Okay? That, that's one of the ways that you can do. Um, and of course, there are things that we have to be aware of, is that um, I, I always assimilate the emergence of ChatGPT the same way as uh, when we have calculators a long time ago. Right? Uh, when we have calculators, there are things that is missing from us. For example, like now our children don't have Pacific. Agreed? Right? They don't have Pacific anymore, right? Because they have calculators. Now even the calculators are being used in the class. Uh, so we have to accept that there are things that is being taken out from us because of ChatGPT itself, of the AI, the generative AI itself. But there are things that we can make it better. As I said earlier, for example, like before this, if let's say you found, uh, maybe you, you, when you give one article, a complex article of physics, for example, and the students could not comprehend, they couldn't answer that, they could not read it. Now, you can always give a complex task to your students to do that with generative AI. And at least they get, they, it gives them a much better idea to see, rather than, you know, um, of course, um, rather than, it's, it's, it's always that we say that, uh, saya dulu-dulu, I always go to the library, you know, I take this book, this book, we cannot say like that to our student anymore. Huh? We cannot just simply um, say that, uh, you know, you should go to the library. It is, what is library? You know, so the student asks a question, what is library? We, we have to understand that it's moving, and of course there are certain things that we are losing, but there are more things that they are getting more than us. So, we have to adapt. Thank you.